decide to go virtual. And um, we thank you very much for uh, joining us this morning. We had a great turnout um, plan for conference offices, um, but fortunately we have an, an even better turnout this morning here online. Uh, we have over 190 people uh, registered and attending this morning. Um, and we have uh, some great, great content from our steering committee members. I would like to ask if you are not on mute, if you could all go on mute. Um, you shouldn't be muted on, um, but we just, uh, I'm getting some background noise. Um, just want to make sure this flows properly. Um, I'm joined by John Gould here at JFC. Um, John is facilitating as well. He's helping drivers. I need to include some uh, a presentation a little bit later on, um, on during this meeting. I uh, just want to introduce myself again, Bill Thompson with JFC. I go back a long time with Max, um, to 28 years, starting with PSDI uh, back in Cambridge um, back in the day, as they say. Uh, I worked with business partners for the last 20 years, and I joined JFC earlier this year. Someone asked me about Maximo and the EAM community and asked me, you know, why is he stuck around? And I tell them about the strength and um, the high quality of the community, the business community of EAM and Maximo. There's, um, it's a very ethical, um, very driven industry, um, as the uh, Port Authority would say, especially in a time like this. As Con Ed would say, as Michael would say, as Massport would say, we just got to keep moving forward, keep going. As Port Authority of New York, New Jersey would say, keep the region moving. I'm uh, going to keep the world moving. And Maximo is an integral part of that. So I've been fortunate to be part of this community for uh, 28 plus years. Um, there's a very diverse and excellent ecosystem amongst uh, business partners, amongst end users amongst organizations uh, throughout the world, and obviously we're focused here in the Northeast. Um, but I just wanted to show, you know, kind of a show of strength, you know, in a very down time, you know, in, in recent history. Um, we have representatives from 21 maximal business owners uh, on this call this morning. Um, I'm going to name check those just so you can kind of hear the diversity of uh, where Maximo is at here in the Northeast United States. We're joined by Amtrak, Bates College, Brandeis University, CNS Wholesale Grocers. We have, some, we have visitors from the West Coast, Shalon PUD. We have Con Edison. We have Cornell University. We have a lot of vendors. <laughs> we have JFK International <laughs> Air Terminal. We have Massport. We have New York Power Authority. We have the National Hotel. We have the New York City Department of Transportation. We have the Port Authority, New York, New Jersey. We have Penn State University. We have Raytheon here in Massachusetts. We have Takeda here in Massachusetts. We've got the University of Delaware. We've got UPS. We've got the U.S. Coast Guard. We've got the U.S. Department of Transportation. We've got the U.S. Mint. We've got a lot. So welcome to the meeting. I'd like to move over to some meeting notes. In first and foremost, um, some people have called in. They're looking. They're asking about the, the um, password. The password was sent, um, I think, three times in the last 24 hours from Bill Thompson. Uh, should be in your email box if you're not getting it. There's um, a welcome message. Um, if you're having trouble, if you're all you're seeing is a welcome message, um, if you click on the Cisco WebEx. Uh, icon in your toolbar, I uh, should be brought back to the meeting. Just a few meeting notes. As um, uh, you may have heard earlier, all attendees are in listen-only mode. Uh, that's a nice way of saying you've all been muted. Um, 200 people talking on a meeting at the same time is not a good thing. So what we're trying to do is get people to converse via the chat feature. The chat feature is on your toolbar in WebEx. It's a um, kind of like a little small cloud next to the steering icon. You can find it on your toolbar. 
We are asking you to submit questions and comments via the chat. Uh, they will be addressed at the end of the meeting by the steering committee. And if you have a um, point that you're trying to make, or uh, if you have, if you can include your role in your organization, um, just to give some context to your questions, um, that would be great. Um, third, this presentation deck will be sent to all Northeast Maximo user group member organizations. Um, so you don't you don't got need to um, submit that question. <laughs> that will be provided to you. And then lastly, not to get ahead of ourselves, um, you know, we're looking for community on the content from the steering committee. We're also looking for your feedback and input on the plan 2020 event. Um, more information on that as we wrap up. But at this point, I'd like to um, hand this over to our chairman of the, steering, of the Northeast Mug Steering Committee, Mr. Bob Fike from Pond Edison. Bob, over to you. All right, thank you very much, Bill. And good morning, everybody. Hopefully you can see me. Um, we don't get to see each other much, see anybody much lately, right? So um, it's very exciting to be here this morning with all of you and to uh, have our first ever Northeast Maximo User Group Conference a la virtual style. Um, yes, we were all supposed to be in a room together at Con Ed in, in New York in our, our uh, headquarters. Um, sorry, Bill, did you say something? No. Okay, uh, but that uh, is not possible because of circumstances, but here we are, and I think we can have a, a great meeting despite all that. Uh, as a matter of fact, I think there's a silver lining here because we've got more attendees than I think we would have had in person and an opportunity to introduce everybody to this great new uh, community. So why are we here? Um, we're here to establish a cross-organizational forum with many different business types, many Maximo users who are currently using Maximo, have been using it for many years, some new to Maximo, and some thinking about using Maximo for their enterprise asset management. Um, so it's a community of Maximo users and asset management professionals here to share our strength, to share ideas, to get ideas from one another, to exchange methods and, um, and contact for that matter. Um, having a community that we can reach out to as, as different challenges come up in our, our work management and asset management lives at, in, in our organization. So having a community like that just makes us all better and helps us to learn sometimes uh, what we don't know that we don't know, if you know that expression, right? Sometimes we don't realize there's an opportunity out there, a solution. And this is the kind of place where we would find out about a solution we didn't realize was out there for us. So um, it's great to, to be here and to kick off this organization. And, and, and Bill already mentioned so many great attendees, so many varied um, business types uh, and industries represented. So there's very great p potential here. Um, and so we're looking forward to hearing from you because what is the Northeast Maximo User Group? Well, it is you. It is all of us. While uh, we have a steering committee and we have uh, excellent vendor support, we everyone who chooses to participate makes up the Northeast Maximo User Group. And so we look forward to hearing from you later in the question and answer period that we will have. So keep in mind your any any questions you come up with, put them in through the chat, um, and we'll we can have a conversation later in in this uh, meeting. Um, but also think about the future, because we will be meeting in person before you know it, hopefully this fall. Um, and we'll talk more about that. But think about ideas you have, uh, things you've implemented at your workplace, in your organization that you would like to share with others. Um, you're certainly going to think of things like that during this meeting. Please um, reach out to be a part of this organization. Uh, I think we could be all much stronger if we all participate. So. Welcome, everyone. Um, and this would not be possible without vendor support. That's the way it has worked in the past. Uh, the Northeast Maximo User Group is made up of the former um, New York Maximo User Group and New England Maximo User Group, where we had sponsors that would support our meetings, and that's the same way we're doing it here. Um, and we have excellent sponsors who have stepped up to support us for this meeting, um, and they are Microdesk, Cohesive Solutions, Interlock Solutions, 
Prometheus Group, Starboard Consulting, and then JFC and Associates, who has been our facilitating sponsor. Um, we've been working with the uh, steering committee, have been working with JFC and Associates since the fall um, to put together this organization, work through a lot of details, and come up to this date here. Um, and so, uh, you know, a virtual round of applause for all those vendors who have helped to make this possible and will continue to help make this possible in the future. Um, so, uh, a little bit about the steering committee. Um, our steering committee is made up of myself as the chairman of Bob Fife with Con Edison on Asset Management Engineering Group. And uh, then Massachusetts Port Authority, Willie Hicks, uh, is on the steering committee, as well as from New York Power Authority, uh, George Perry and Ilya Yermolenko. Um, so that is the current steering committee makeup, which will, over years to come, no doubt change. And there's opportunity for everyone to have some influence there and to and to support the organization. Um, so let's get the conversation started. Let's talk about what reliability really means to your organization and to our organization. Um, we're going to hear from three different businesses, starting with myself for Con Edison, as well as uh, we'll hear from uh, Massachusetts Port Authority, Willie Hicks, and what reliability means there, as well as the New York Power Authority from George Perry and Ilya Malenko. So, let's talk about Con Ed and what reliability really means to us here. So, a little bit about who we are. We are the, the energy company for the City of New York, the five boroughs in Westchester, and second and we have nine million people plus in our service territory 101 substations transmission and distribution 98,000 miles of underground cable 37,000 miles of overhead cable the transmission and distribution of electricity um, a dielectric system for our underground transmission system which I think is a particularly uh, special uh, asset type that we have to manage with over 9 million gallons of oil in those pipes, and of course the uh, associated environmental considerations. 127 pressurization plants, these are separate facilities to keep the pressure up in those uh, transmission lines. Um, and then we have the largest steam system in the world. We distribute steam to customers, uh, up to 8.4 million pounds per hour in, in the winter time, uh, for both, both heat and also for air conditioning. Uh, we, have, we are a gas provider, 4,330 miles of gas pipeline, and we generate electricity and steam. Um, uh, not as much as we did before deregulation, but we still have uh, several uh, power plants uh, for that purpose. So, so we at Con Ed have varied businesses that drive our use of maximum. Um, we, and that's what we'll, we'll do in this conversation about Con Edison, is look at how those varied work types required varied solutions. And uh, some examples that we'll look at to illustrate how we take varied approaches is the way we identify assets, asset identification, um, mobility, and what we're doing in that area, as well as governance uh, with Maximo when you have so many different business types in the system, as well as many interested in coming on. And then finally, we'll kind of sum it up with what reliability means to us at Con Ed. There we go. So some of the different business types we have at Con Ed, uh, substations is a, is a big user of Maximo and uh, has been using it for a very long time both transmission and distribution substations. So that is a certain kind of business with a certain uh, set of asset types, transformers, circuit breakers, uh, but end buildings as well, facilities and so on. Um, and then the, we have the facility services group, typical facilities business, right? Taking care of buildings, doors, windows, lights, and, and everything and all the mechanical side of that whole thing. Another kind of business. Um, then we have generation, power plants. So here we have a small footprint, right? Everybody in one big building. We pick up an echo. All right. And 
we cleared the echo. Excellent. So generation is a different type where, where we look at things from a system perspective. And um, steam distribution, pipes throughout the city, uh, all over Manhattan, underground pump uh, distributing steam to customers. Those are linear assets, right? So that's a different way to use Maximo with linear assets, same with transmission operations, overhead and underground, both linear assets with point assets along the way. Um, there's an opportunity to use Maximo linear. Uh, and slide, there we go. Oh, there we go. And um, also, then we have a, a different business type. Construction services is a group in our company that acts more like a vendor to support all these other departments. Um, so while they have a limited number of assets of their own in their shop in the Bronx, where they do say a machine shop and then they fabricate things, they're, the bigger part of their business is to go out and do work for each of these other customers on the other customer's assets. So that's a different approach, a different way to think of how we would use Maximo with them. Um, Chem Lab, very similar, right? They're doing chemical chemistry services for all these different businesses. Then we have a water treatment plant where you treat flush water. This is water that is used to flush out manholes before our employees can go in there and work in them. That water is flushed through and then removed, and it definitely can't be uh, released to the environment until we process it. So we've got flush water treatment facilities using Maximo. And then system operations, our energy control system is also Maximo users and with their uh, own special needs. And, and there's more. Um, I could go on and on about the varied business needs within the umbrella of Con Edison and therefore the varied approaches we have to take when we uh, use Maximo. So let's go to the next slide. There we go. So one enterprise asset management system, but many business types. So we are currently on Maximo 7.5 and 7.6. We're actually all transitioning um, all Maximo users to Maximo 7.6. We're in the middle of an upgrade right now. If anybody wants to talk upgrade sometime. Um, and then in conjunction with Maximo, our mobile solution is Dave Slice, which is from Prometheus. Um, and uh, between those two, that's our primary way to document work uh, and to drive uh, work compliance and so on. So um, back to the subject of uh, different approaches for different businesses, you know, assets have to be identified in different ways. Uh, substations, for example, we talk about geography, are spread all over the five boroughs in Westchester. But if I talk about a generating plant, well, it's all in one building. Very different approaches, and we'll talk about how we identify assets because of the different situations. Each business has different compliance needs. Some have to comply with uh, you know, FDNY or the Public Service Commission for one reason or another. Um, NERC, FERC, uh, as you no doubt um, have to comply with certain ones in your world. DOT in a limited number of Con Edison maximal users, whereas your business might be a, a lot of DOT regulations. So each business has its own needs, metrics, different metrics for each business that we have to drive um, and support through the way we implement maximal. Documentation, uh, different documentation for different needs. And sometimes there's even conflicts. One department may want to do one thing in the asset module, for example, or in work order tracking, and that may conflict with something someone else is already doing. So the potential for conflicting um, needs within the application is, is something to, to keep in mind, and we'll talk a little bit about how we're, we can deal with that and how we can better organize that uh, as we go, go forward here in the slides. But, also, the management structure, the organizational structure of different businesses and different ways uh, will impact the way we use Maximo for them, the way we organize responsible area, uh, labor group, and crew ID, different things like that. And then uh, finally, we'll talk about mobility and the different needs for mobility of different businesses. So next, please. So let's talk about how we approach asset identification. Um, I've spoken about this before in other 
uh, forums about our intuitive location IDs. And that's not the, necessarily the point of this slide, although it is related. But the point here is to talk about how um, different asset types require a different approach. So let's look at some examples. The first two bullets there are examples of um, assets for our underground transmission system. Now, uh, if you look working left to right, that first one at M is Manhattan, then 38M71 is a feeder. And then it's what, what kind of asset is this? It's the cable, and it's a segment of cable between two manholes. So this is a linear asset. Um, and by the way, we haven't implemented linear yet, but we are looking at it right now, um, maximal linear, that, that module. Um, but we we needed a solution before linear was available, and this is the way we implemented uh, to identify linear assets. So here we're looking at a segment of cable between two manholes. Those are the manhole numbers on the end of the number. But notice the feeder, it goes from Manhattan through also through Queens. So that same feeder, the same, same cable uh, has a Queens section, and it begins with Q, and speeders in there and so on, and then the two manholes and queens that it, it runs between. So that's one approach for one business type for linear assets. And we can take a similar approach with other linear type uh, assets like steam distribution and so on. And then the, the next example is a power plant, right? So one of our generating plants, West 59th Street, um, and in this case, we look at it from a uh, unit perspective, in this case, the package boiler unit, um, PD, and zero is common for all the package boilers. And it's the, what's it's based on systems. In this case, it's, you know, the linear assets for um, above that, we're looking at speeders as the primary way of breaking this up. But in a generating station, we look at the system. So feed water system, oil system, gas system. Um, atomizing steam system and so on. In this case, we're looking at the feed water system. And what kind of equipment is this? It's a pump and it's pump number two. So this is feed water pump number two for the package boilers at West 59th Street. So a different approach to asset identification for a different business, in this case, generating plant. The next example is for our SCADA system. The SCADA system is about um, getting information from throughout our operating territory, as well as sending information out. Um, and there's, it's thousands and thousands of points of information, both analog and digital. Uh, in this case, we're, we're talking about a point that's in Brooklyn, and it's at Plymouth Street substation. And that number one tells me it's an analog point versus a number two would tell me it's a digital point. And then finally, the unique identifier there, uh, on the end. So that's how we use it for our SCADA system, which relates to our system operations group. And then, excuse me for one second. Okay, and then finally, we look at an example from substation operations. In this case, uh, and by the way, the drill down on the right side of the screen, that's a screenshot from Maximum 75 location hierarchy drill down. This matches. Uh, I'm about to talk about for substations. Substations, we organize geographically. Um, in this case, we start with Westchester, and then in this, this asset is in Westchester South portion of substations, Elmsford substation, and the, the high tension operating growing for Elmsford is 642B. That's part of the nomenclature here. What kind of equipment is it? It's a battery, and it's a 125 volt battery, which bank, bank number two. So another approach to asset identification driven by the business needs. So let's go to the next slide. There's a little closer look at that hierarchy. Um, in locations, in Maximo, uh, we have a parent-child relationship. So we'll have category level locations like that one that says, well, in this illustration, we're looking for a cap bank at Bensonhurst 2 substation in Brooklyn. So I. I look under Brooklyn, then I choose Bensonhurst 2 uh, substation, which is, that's a location ID, B-BH-47 is a location record of its own in Maximo. Underneath that, I have a category, cap banks, capacitor banks for that station. And then under there are all the individual locations. So that's the way it works through a hierarchy. 
And this intuitive hierarchy is very effective in helping a broad range of users to find specific assets uh, and put them on work orders. And that really is the beginning of us getting good lifecycle information about an asset in our work management system. So a very important step is specific asset identification, and this approach helps with that. Next slide, please. So next we'll talk about mobility. Um, so we have uh, several different examples of mobility we've implemented at Con Ed. Um, not on this slide is uh, what we're doing in transmission operations in the overhead. We have, uh, you know, towers like you see along the interstate highway with high tension lines on them, and we have uh, uh, linemen out there doing tower inspections and line inspections, and they need to do this in a mobile fashion. And believe it or not, we actually do have sections where we don't have a cyber signal, so they have to be able to do it offline. So they have a mobile solution for that using iPads out in the field. And then Transmission Underground is using it um, for manhole inspections to take videos of those manholes and, and associate it with the um, inspection. And they're doing that on data splice in both cases, using data splice to document the inspection and, and associate a, a file pictures and, and, and the videos. And then on the slide here, we're talking about substations implementation of mobility. Operators um, in the station, they need to be in the control room often, and then they need to be out in the field as well. And what we're doing is replacing the control room computer with a, with a mobile uh, tablet um, in a, in a uh, dock so that they can use it just like a regular computer and then take it out of the dock and take it out to the field. And wherever they are, they have access to all of the company applications that they need. They can uh, run them out there in the station. And we're uh, connecting by both Wi-Fi and by the cellular Verizon network. Uh, for mechanics, oh, by the way, the operator device can be used by multiple users. Uh, Security-wise, they can different operators can log in on the same device. For mechanics, we're having a device dedicated to, to an individual mechanic, much like one of their own tools in their toolbox, a single user device. And they can complete their maximum work orders using data splice uh, in the field while they're on the job. They can bring up the job plan and look at it and review the work package for this. Uh, we're doing job briefings on these mobile devices. So in the field, you can have a job briefing with the crew talk about safety concerns and uh, all the other things you do during a tailgate talk, a job briefing, and even have people sign it with their finger on the screen. Uh, again, using the same connectivity methods. And um, so there's a couple examples of how mobility is shaped by the business types and uh, what we've been doing at Con Ed in that regard. Next slide. There's a screenshot of data splice on a, an I, uh, iPad. And uh, this is a breaker inspection job plan where they answer a lot of questions. As they answer all these questions, when they've answered them all, they, it's complete, it's saved and associated with the maximal work order, and it changes the status of the maximal work order to complete. Uh, we also use it for corrective maintenance, and we have a default job plan with generic questions, more, a little more generic, but some good specific stuff. Uh, to help complete a correct maintenance work order. I mean, all of these things, by the way, we could talk for hours about any number of these topics, and I welcome anybody uh, contact information at the end. If you want to follow up with me and talk more about specifics on this, I'd be happy to we do a, another WebEx just with you, whoever you are, and we can talk about how we do it. So let's go. Next slide shows um, our work package. This is. Uh, in a program we call Engage that we're using in, for some of the Maximo users right now, where you put together a whole package with all the files, attachments, pictures, steps, and so on, and all the Maximo information for that job so that they have it ready to go um, to go work the job. Uh, we're also, by the way, implementing Scheduler Plus for uh, our generation group for starters, and uh, likely other groups at some point in the future as well. So we have Scheduler Plus, and we're working with that to implement it as a scheduling and planning tool. So next. Next slide, there we go. And so the last topic I want to talk about, 
uh, under the different varied ways that we apply Maximo, is that we have to have some governance. We make changes in Maximo when we approach the way we do things. Uh, right now, we have you, you've seen how many are currently using Maximo at time and how many different business sites, and there are several others waiting to come on to it because we're we're limited. We actually have two different uh, asset enterprise asset management application to Con Ed, but Maximo has been is being used by a, a large percent of the company. And so, as new users want to come on, we have to look at uh, their needs uh, and consistently implement the science of asset management and, and share uh, the experience we already have. And so, forming a governance team um, has, is something we're doing in order to create consistency and to apply the tools consistently, to not operate in silos, but to take what we've already known, what we already learned from previous experiences and help new users come on and use the same tools. It's a great time saver, helps us to implement more efficiently, and helps us to promote the key practices and understanding of how you should use the system. We've got years of experience with this. Again, we've been on Maximo since 1998, and um, many of us in the asset management engineering term team have those years of experience that we can share with new users coming on. And so, and then we innovate as well. So as users bring their um, needs, their challenges uh, to the fore, we look at that. We think about how we can do things better, how we can get better. And as we come up with these new solutions, we share them with other users. And internally, um, we promote best practices and get better. We try not to reinvent the wheel um, if we've already got a solution in place that should work for uh, a new challenge, we use it. But we also try to fit every business type. So the governance team is, has been an important part of uh, dealing with the varied business types we have. And then the next slide, please. And then finally, we want to talk about what reliability means to us and what I thought of in answer to this question is the fact that it's all about making good decisions. We, um, as asset management professionals, we are in the middle of the life of an asset, right? And there's all these different stakeholders all around us who have an interest in our assets, whether it be the Public Service Commission or the uh, CEO of the company or the mechanic in the field who's uh, she's uh, working on the circuit breaker and she needs to know certain information and or it maybe it's an engineer at, at Irving Place, our headquarters, who needs to share information with that mechanic in the field. We're in the middle, and it's our job to help all of those stakeholders make good decisions, informed decisions. And so we look to capture key information that uh, is important and useful and drive people to give us that information. Uh, there, the people in the field know things that we need other people to know elsewhere. So we need to capture it and then share it in a targeted way, targeted communication uh, through different tools, notifications, automated emails to the right people at the right time. And to do this with accuracy, we want good, clear, useful information because well-informed people make good decisions. And we want people to understand what they need to understand and know what they need to know about the assets so they can do the right thing and do their job most effectively. So that's what reliability in you know, a sum up means for us. And uh, so I appreciate your attention. And um, next slide, please. Go to the next slide. There we go. So um, feel free to reach out to me, Bob Fike at ConEd, and my email is there, FikeW at ConEd. If you have any questions or you'd like to follow up with a more detailed conversation about any of these topics, um, I'd love to talk and shop with you. And then, um, so now, uh, again, thank you for your attention. And please give your attention now to Willie Hicks from Massachusetts Port Authority.
to tell us about their reliability approach. Okay. Can everyone hear me? Um, my name is Louie Hicks. I am a project manager with uh, AE Services Capital Programs at the Massachusetts Port Authority. And I'd like to take a few minutes to share with you a little bit about enterprise asset management here at Massport. Specifically, what reliability is and what, is it, what does it mean for us? Well, first, I'd like to share, take a little bit of time to share a little bit about Massport. Most people, initial thought when I mention Massport is Logan International Airport. And Logan is a beautiful facility that is also the largest transportation center in New England. We have a fire department, a police department, a power plant, we have hotels, we have a chapel. We're like a city within a city. The only thing we don't have is a post office. Next slide. However, Massport is more than just Logan. Uh, we also have Worcester Regional Airport, and it boasts, it boasts a $15 million passenger terminal and is conveniently located in the heart of Central Mass. Uh, and it serves Worcester County, which is the second fastest growing county in Massachusetts. The airport offers five daily round trip services through JetBlue, American Airlines, and Delta Airlines with connections to over 120 destinations around the globe. Next slide. We also have Hanscom Field. And Hanscom Field is a civil airport that serves as a corporate reliever for Logan. Hanscom Field is located just 20 miles north of west, northwest of Boston and was acquired by the Commonwealth back in 1941. Military operations actually dominated Hanscom until it became a joint military and civilian facilities in the, in the 1950s. But today, it is a popular choice for business executives who want easy access to eastern Massachusetts and is the home to private and corporate air aircrafts of all size and offers limited commercial services. Next slide. We also have the Port of Boston which is the oldest continually active port in, in the Western Hemisphere. The Boston Harbor is a bustling and, rec and um, no, is bustling. Hey, you... <laughs> the Boston Harbor, <laughs> yeah, so let me start that over again. So the Port of Boston is the oldest continually active port in Western Hemis in Western Hemisphere. It is bustling with recreation and commerce, and we handle over 1.5 million metric tons of cargoes yearly at our Conley Terminal, which serves seven of the world's top 10 line, uh, container lines. We also have Boston uh, Cruise Port Boston, uh, because Boston is a popular point of call destination, and several major cruise lines use Cruise Port Boston Black Franklin Terminal Black Falcon Cruise Terminal, which has been renamed to the Ray Flynn Cruise Port Terminal. And we serve more than 300,000 passengers who pass through Boston every year as they set off for holiday cruises and to visit Boston as a port of call. Boston is also a popular port of call destination and serves several major cruise lines. We also have the Boston Auto Port, which is located in Charlestown, Massachusetts. And it, it has the, uh, the ability to process more than 70,000 vehicles per year for import and export. So what does reliability mean to us? Next slide. So reliability has to do with the eliminations of failure codes, uh, failure modes, I should say and the management of resources to minimize the frequency of unavoidable failures. When we talk about reliability, we recognize that it starts with aligning the organization for reliability. So at Massport, we recognize that when implemented, a reliability-centered maintenance program optimizes our maintenance program. And, it makes a, it make, and that makes it a corporate-level maintenance strategy. And what we, when I say a corporate level maintenance strategy, I mean that this program has to be implemented from the top down. 
you cannot implement a reliability center maintenance from the bottom up. It, it can be driven by your technicians. It has to be driven by your leadership. Understanding that the probability that a component or system will perform or require function for a given time helps us to understand and determine our maintenance strategy, which also includes identifying and prioritizing the work that is considered reliability. And that helps us to understand how this work improves the customer experience at the airport. Next slide. So how are we using Maximal at Massport? Well, we use it with facility maintenance. Facility maintenance, what we're looking to do is we're looking to move from just simply time-based maintenance to more meter and condition-based maintenance where possible. Fleet maintenance uses it. We're helping with everything from corrective to preventative and to track, even to tracking annual vehicle inspections. So we have an, uh, we've loaned an application of service request and, and uh, the asset application that notifies what we call vehicle coordinators when their vehicles that, that, that they're responsible for managing are due for uh, state inspections. Uh, we, we give them the ability to report failures at state inspection stations as well as when the vehicles pass. And so we keep track of that to make sure that all Massport vehicles are being, or Massport vehicles at Logan currently are being maintained. Our building maintenance group, what we do is that what we're doing here is we're leveraging Maximo for more than just facility maintenance because we have other departments that perform maintenance and they use a whole different set of resources. They have different technicians, they have different assets that they maintain, different inventory. Uh, so we, we leverage Maximo to maintain, uh, to serve more than just our facility department. We are also using it for, and we're implementing a, a process of capital asset tracking. With our capital asset tracking, one of the things that, that happened when I came on board was that we didn't have a, a, an asset data collection process for capital projects, not a, not a robust process. So what we're trying to do is that we're implementing a process where we're collecting information and developing preventive maintenance strategies, collecting O&M and warranty information and entering that information into Maximo. And we start at the design phase of a capital project. We start at design and we go all the way through construction and all the way over to turnover. And the intent there is that when a project gets to turn over to facilities. They have everything in place that they need to maintain that facility. We're using it with our purchasing contracts. Uh, we are what we're doing there is is uh, in is that we're using the maximal purchase contract module to allow for the auditing of blanket purchase agreement invoices. One of the issues that we've had is that we with our blanket purchase agreements. It's because it was a manual process, and it still is somewhat of a manual process because we haven't integrated with our PeopleSoft appli uh, mod uh, application yet, is that a lot of times because it was a manual process and was done on paper that we were being overcharged. We, we had blanket purchase agreements, and when, when, when we were invoiced, we were being charged more than what uh, was con the items were contracted to be priced at. So what uh, what we've done is we've implemented a, a simple process whereby we can allow for our purchasing department to perform audits on inventory on invoices as they come in, and allows them to deep dive wherever they may find uh, additional issues uh, or may do, may need to expand an investigation of a vendor. And we also do inventory management with our currently it's our fleet department, but we are expanding that to other Logan departments and other Massport sites. Uh, this allows them to, uh, to to track their current balances, to do their ABC analysis, to calculate their turns. Uh, so it allows them to manage their inventory. Next slide. Maximum mobility. We have three different uh, applications that were served up using uh, mobility. One is Maximum Anywhere by IBM. Uh, it allows our technicians to work offline. Um, they can continue to work with secure data uh, and then synchronize once uh, connectivity is restored. So they are using this in, throughout the airport terminals, uh, in, in our crawl spaces, and in, in areas like that. Um, for 
groups or for departments that have constant Wi-Fi connectivity, we use the Maximal Every Place application. The Maximal Every Place application is actually just a Maximal application that's, form that's formatted to fit within the form factors for iPhones or tablets. We currently use either iPhones or iPads. Uh, we use the iPad minis or the, uh, the larger iPads, but mostly the iPad minis. The other thing that we've done is we've using and we use the um, the AirWatch application. The AirWatch application allows us to uh, to um, push out applications to the mobile devices. And one of those applications that we do is uh, the Maximal Service Request application. So we form fit it. It's like we lost you there, Willie. Oh, oh, sorry, my cat hit my mute button. Sorry. <laughs> so, uh, Classic. The, yeah, uh, my cat. Um, so, the maximal service request, what it does is it allows users to be able to create service requests while they're on the go. So, in the past, they used to have to see an incident or see an issue rush back to the office, log into Maximo and submit a request. And now it allows them to be able to submit a request, attach a photo if appropriate, and submit the request while they're out in the field. Next slide. So as you can tell, you know, when I'm not coming for, to you from the top of some mountain where I've acquired all of knowledge Maximo. We're just getting started, and I look forward to sharing the experiences, ideas, and solutions with everyone in this group. Uh, I encourage you to participate by presenting. It's the best way for a user group to develop common interests, goals, and desired outcomes. Next slide. Thank you. And here's my contact information again. It's Willie Hicks. I'm at the Massachusetts Port Authority. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to George Perry, New York Power and Authority. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Bob and Willie, for those very interesting presentations. And uh, I'd like to take the opportunity to welcome you again to the inaugural Northeast MUG conference, even though it's a virtual one instead of the in-person one we had planned at Con Ed, uh, for today. My name is George Perry, and I will be presenting today along with my colleague, Ilya Yermolenko. Our goal is to give you a little bit of insight into New York Power Authority, our enterprise asset management system, and our use of Maximo. For us, after considering safety, reliability means everything. Next slide. The New York Power Authority owns and operates 16 generating stations all across the state of New York. From Niagara Falls to Messina, to New York City, out to the island and beyond, we have dedicated employees and in state-of-the-art equipment working to provide clean and reliable power. In all, we generate approximately 25% of the state's electric power. We also operate 1,400 circuit miles of high voltage transmission lines so that that power may be safely and reliable, reliably delivered throughout the state. But we are much more than that. We are economic development. We help to create jobs by providing low cost power to manufacturers across the state who use those savings to keep jobs here in New York. We are also keen on emerging technologies that allow us and all New Yorkers to be energy efficient, making our use of electricity more reliable and resulting in significant cost savings for all New Yorkers. Examples of this would be our smart grid technology, offshore wind power, electric vehicles and associated charging stations, and much, much more. Next slide, please. Speaking of economic development, long before any of this was made possible, there was the Erie Canal. The Erie Canal was built between 1817 and 1825, and with it, paved the way for commerce across the state from the Hudson Valley, or the Hudson River near Albany, to um, Lake Erie near Buffalo, New York. But it did much more than that. 
It opened up the Midwest to trade with New York City and beyond, helping the country to grow and prosper at a rate never before seen. The New York Power Authority is proud to manage the New York Canals Corporation as part of our portfolio of assets. We invite you to visit these wonderful recreational facilities where you can also envision what interstate commerce was like 200 years ago. Next slide, please. But we are here today to talk about enterprise asset, asset management and Maximo. So let's talk about that for a few minutes. At NIPA, we currently manage over 70,000 assets through our EAM system, and we use IBM Maximo as our system of record. We currently run on Maximo version 7.609, which we upgraded to in May of 2018. NIPA has used Maximo as an asset work management tool for over 20 years, but never to the extent that we do today. Today, we are making significant effort to bring nearly every facet of our business under one umbrella so that we can gain better insight into how our business runs, what it needs, and how to make intelligent business decisions that give us the best chance of organizational success. We do that by making our people better, from our mechanics and planners in the field, to engineering, to operations, to our decision makers, right up to our CEO. Uh, we've been using Maximo to make everything a little bit more efficient. We're currently in the process of taking fleet, environmental health and safety, uh, adding some procurement efficiencies and some regulatory efficiencies, including the new Step 13 standard into Maximo to improve our business. Next slide, please. In order to achieve success, we rely heavily on our people. After all, you can have the best tools at your disposal to do any number of tasks, but without a dedicated and well-trained workforce, you would ultimately fail. At NIPA, we have approximately 1,800 Maximo users, and we employ a robust training and certification program in order to empower them to make the best use of Maximo and to help us run a state-of-the-art enterprise asset management system. As Bob and Willie both mentioned, we have many, many different business groups and many different needs among those business groups that we must satisfy. In order to do that, we currently employ four different Maximo environments. We have our production environment, which is our live instance of Maximo where business is conducted. We have a training environment, which is used uh, for um, users to practice uh, on Maximo without affecting the production environment. We have quality assurance where we do much of our testing. And then we have development where the product is designed and developed according to our business rules. No one single software system can adequately run our business due to its many complexities. So we have integrations with other software and Maximo to close the gap. We will continue to add these integrations as the needs of the business dictate and eliminate those that no longer make sense. One of the ways that we have seen significant improvement is how we manage parts of the business through our digital worker program and our efforts around mobility. To that end, I'd like to ask my colleague, Ilya Yermolenko, to say a few words about our mobility program using Data Spice and Maximo. Ilya? Thank you, George, and thank you everyone for coming to our inaugural meeting. Uh, what is mobility for NIPA? It is capturing data in the field. We're currently using data slice for our front end application for Maximo, and we're using it for divisions such as line patrol, which is transmissions. We're using it for operator rounds, as well as dam inspections, safety, environmental facilities, and security inspections. For our line patrol and transmissions, we set up meters within Maximo. There are seven meters set up for each of the structures. There are three meters set up for three spans, and the meters are set up simply for the pass and fail questions. Once the operator or the line patrol crew identifies anything wrong with the meter, they would simply enter fail, and that information would go directly to Maximo. Also, we're using our line patrols for vegetation management, 
such as identification of danger trees. And we, you, when the, the what is the danger tree is the is the tree identified by our LIDAR technology, which which is identified by going into the into the span. All the values are entered into maximal. For the operator rounds, we're using our handheld devices to, to capture data directly in the field. Various points are captured, such as temperature, run times, tank levels, oil levels, gauge readings, and etc. For the demonstration, we're simply using it for the visual inspection, and all of the points are captured digitally, not on paper. For the safety, we have, con we have converted the AD devices for our inspections. We are going to use this for our fire protection as well, such as for fire extinguishers and safety lights. For facilities, we're using the application for the building management and building grounds. And we're also going to expand this for security inspections, such as perimeters. When the work order is entered through the line patrol and uh, synchronized with the maximum, this is an easy access by all departments, such as real estate, foresters, and planters. There's no need to go to a separate system. Everything is at your fingertip. Everyone sees the same information in one system. This also speeds up the communication. It eliminates any miscommunication between the departments. It speeds up the process of um, communicating between them. For the operator rounds, the inspections are performed at various intervals for each of the sites. They can be performed daily, they can be performed weekly. Within the inspections, we have limits and alarms set up. Um, if an operator enters value that is above the limit or an, or an alarm, the message would show up and let them know that they can create with the plan of action and to log the issue or create the work order if necessary. When the work order is created, they can absolutely take pictures and that information will go, once they synchronized, that information would go into Maximo. Work, there is no need to create a duplicate work order. The reason why is because when the operator creates a work order, it will tell them the work order history. We also, at the end of the day, we have um, reports going to all of the supervisors with completed procedures, also with any alarms that have been generated. At, at some of our sites, we have converted all of our PMs into the inspections, and now uh, two of our sites are completely paperless. We're also going to expand into the QR codes and the QR codes, um, basically we can use it two ways. One is if you're looking for the asset and you scan the QR code, that asset information would show up, such as work order history, any specifications. Or if you're using it within the round, it'll jump to that specific asset. Um, if, and um, George, I will go, I'm going to pass it over to George now. Okay, thank you, Ilya. Um, so what's new and what's next? Well, about six weeks ago, I should have talked with you about our very ambitious program for adding new departments and new functionality in Maximo. Then everything changed. Um, because reliability is so important in our business, the decision was made to pause many of the projects we had in progress and to concentrate on our core business. So for now, I will say that all of the projects you see here are important and they will get done eventually, just not maybe on the timeline that you see on this screen. Next slide. I'd like to leave you with a few thoughts about enterprise asset management at New York Tower Authority. The first of which is that we take it very seriously. To that end, we make significant investments in the technology necessary to make the intelligent business decisions that all New Yorkers depend on us to make. As an example, we developed our and installed the first of its kind integrated smart operations center. This operations center is the combination of several different diagnostic tools reporting from our all across the state to one centralized location where the cumulative data can be interpreted and analyzed 
so that action may be taken in real time. We are determined to be the first end-to-end -end digital utility so that all the necessary data and information necessary to make those intelligent business decisions are available at a moment's notice when those decisions need to be made. Lastly, we recently became the first electric utility in North America to earn the ISO 55001 certification. We wanted to measure our enterprise asset management system against the best in the world, and after a fairly arduous process, we learned that although there was always room for improvement, we measured up against the best. Our motto is continuous improvement. Next slide, please. One thought I'd like to leave everyone with is that we are all in this together. As Bob and Willie both said, one of the greatest things about belonging to organizations like the Northeast MUG is the networking opportunities and business relationships that are formed. The exchange of ideas and expertise that you provide makes us all better at what we do. On behalf of all of us, I'd like to thank you for attending today's virtual conference. At this point, I'd like to turn it back over to Bill Thompson from JSB Associates for our sponsor spotlight. Thank you. Thank you, George. That was really phenomenal. Thank you, Ilya. Um, we have a slight uh, modification. We're actually going to have uh, John Gould. Um, this is a uh, maximal thought of the day, or as this was to be hosted in Lower Manhattan, Maximo in a New York Minute, and um, I'll introduce uh, John Gould, our Director of EAM Services from JFC. Thank you, John. Thanks, Bill. Uh, thanks to Bob, uh, Willie, George, Ilya. Um, great content stuff there. Really wish we had the opportunity to do this in person because I think uh, we could have had a lot of really great discussion uh, with everyone in the room, but we're going to we're gonna set some time aside at the end here for some Q&A. Um, just wanted to kind of do a little maximum New York Minute here and shift the gears a little bit. potentially. Um, so for those of you who don't know, JFC and Associates, we're out of Boston, and uh, we have a, a real like of our football team here in New England, even though we've lost one of our greats. Uh, we still trust in Bill, Bill Belichick, and uh, I just wanted to kind of give a quote here of what he has to say. So if you sit back and spend too much time feeling good about what you did in the past, you're going to come up short next time. So that's really applicable to one of our one of our real tenants here and our theme of the, the conference is what a reliability mean to your organization. Um, you know, we can't rest on our laurels. And as you've seen, a lot of the presentation content here is really focused on improvement, right? Having a plan, having a roadmap, incremental change. Um, and with all that, you know, the Port Authority New York slogan is really, really important in today's landscape, right? So talk about keep the region moving. You know, our assets still need to operate, facilities still need to function, and systems need to be available in our, in our current landscape. And really, you know, Maximo's importance now more than ever, um, being able to be a system that's utilized to support your asset management needs is, is more critical than before. And the, really the focal point, too, and we talk about reliability and, and asset management, and, and that's really the foundation. And I think we've gotten a lot of content from our our, our members here to, to talk about those things and, and understanding the asset management and those functions that support asset management are those foundational efforts. And really, Maximo is the enabler, right? It's the tool that you can use. And we always focus on the three tenets of people, process, and technology. And I think when you talk about implementing Maximo and using Maximo effectively to meet your reliability goals, that's really something that you want to uh, communicate effectively throughout your organization. So kind of threw this together. I mean, obviously, we're in a little bit of an interesting landscape now. Moving forward while still staying home. Hope everyone's staying home, washing their hands. Um, there's some opportunities while we're home, right? We don't have a lot of the noise and the distractions that we may have in our offices if you're lucky enough to be able to work from home. Uh, it's a good opportunity to look at your maximum data. Um, you clean out old work orders, um, come up with the strategies on some of the things we talked about today about asset naming conventions and hierarchies and systems. Um, you know, alignment and planning. You can still do a lot of planning and, and review when you're disconnected here and not, not in person. You know, looking at your current state, understanding the capabilities you have now and planning for the future. Um, and then engagement, right? So utilize this time away from your desk to engage with your leadership on your maximum trajectory. You know, understanding where you are today is going to be important for where we're going to go forward. 
you know, one of the things I, I recommend folks that are using Maximo is to really identify a three-year planning effort. You know, your roadmap for any upgrades, a lot of the functionality that's coming out today is no longer uh, in version releases, but in uh, enhancement fix pack type functionality. Um, that's really important that you understand those things and look to those tools that are available to you. Um, data integrity and validation. You know, what better time than now when you can sit down and actually take a look at that data and determine how valuable and how much integrity it has, the process that that data is collected, um, and then processes to validate it to make sure that those things that are being entered into your system of record are accurate. Um, identify functional and technical enhancements. So we, where it's talked about today with Bob and, and Willie and George and Ilya is, you know, technology is constantly changing. And as such, you should really take a look at your functional business processes as well to see, you know, if there's opportunities to improve there and align it with those things that are available. And then obviously mobility, we talked a lot about that today. Uh, mobility is now the, uh, the standard, it is no longer the exception. And really, as an organization, you should be looking at those things, not only to say we need to have mobility, but even if you have mobility now, is your mobility tool the right tool? That technology changes so often that the functionality and enhancements that are made in the different platforms, uh, Maximo Anywhere just came out with the new release, 764, um, robust solution. I really encourage you to take a look at that because there's definitely a lot of um, improvement made on IBM's side to really make that tool more user-friendly and um, a really powerful mobility tool for your organization. Um, and then just recognizing opportunities. So every every organization on this call today has an op opportunity to do things just a little bit better in the future. Um, you know, and that can be just personally taking the time to learn the new skills. You know, IBM has a badging program for different functionality they have around Maximo, just a really opportunity to learn the new functionality that's out there and apply those leading practices. There's a lot of really good content out there and we have a lot of great members on the call today that we can circulate and have discussions about. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about how we're gonna enable some of those things moving forward towards the end. Um, and then really the focus on reliability. So back to our conference theme, um, Terrence O'Hanlon, for those of you who know him with Reliability Web, his quote is, is, is really relevant today more than ever, uh, realizing a future that wasn't going to happen anyway. So understanding where your organization is on their reliability journey, and where you can better equip yourself, you know, while we're home here, or in some cases we're not, but if we're home and have those opportunities to expand our knowledge base around reliability, uh, what better time than now? So it's a real opportunity as well. And I would be remiss if I didn't include, uh, include another quote here at the end of the slide, another bill, uh, Billy Joel, the good old days weren't always good and tomorrow ain't as bad as it seems. Um, so really just kind of closing things out on this Maximo minute about, you know, don't rest on your laurels. Um, just because you did something in the past and thought it was good um, doesn't really mean that it was. And tomorrow's not going to be as bad as it seems. So, you know, we've got a lot of great people on this call today. We're going to be, you know, communicating with you going forward. Um, really, that's the purpose of these Maximo user groups is about collaboration and understanding I've been in the Maximo space for over 15 years myself now and um, started off as a user, shifted through the consulting roles, but uh, ultimately the ability to interact with our community uh, is gonna be really critical as we kind of enter this next, next era um, post pandemic. So really encourage you to, to be collaborative and, and, and work together on, on opportunities uh, that you may be able to identify in your organization. So my contact information there as well. If you have any questions, uh, please do feel free to shoot me a note. Uh, one of the things that I would like to do is just, if you do have some questions um, around content from the presentations earlier, utilize the chat box. Uh, we're gonna be taking a look at that as we go through here, but uh, really importantly, gonna kind of transition over to Bill here, is just to talk, talk through some of our sponsorships that we have, uh, the sponsors, I'm sorry, um, that have really enabled us to be able to do these things with you as well as uh, really looking forward to the opportunities we're able to have to gather as a group in the fall. So with that, I'm gonna hand it back over to Bill. Thank you, John. Keep the region moving, keep moving forward. Um, I would like to reiterate um, John's uh, comment about, um, you know, soliciting um, questions, feedback for um, Con Ed or Massport or NIPA, or for anyone else on the call. Um, any, any, any instances that you have, you know, 
Speak now or forever hold your peace. We're going to go uh, spend a couple minutes on a sponsor spotlight. Um, gives you some time to uh, uh, log in your chat uh, questions. Um, I'd like to thank our, um, when we started planning this, we immediately um, we solicited um, support from uh, these five organizations. Uh, JFC is a facilitator. Um, we needed some strong sponsors and um, Cohesive, Interlock, Microdesk, Prometheus Group, and Starboard all stepped up and immediately um, supported the group and has supported us through the transition from an on-site meeting today to this virtual meeting and they will be with us in the fall and we'll talk about that in a couple of minutes. First I'd like to just spend about a minute um, for each um, of our sponsors. If uh, John, if you could um, move us forward. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank Cohesive Solutions. Um, you can just walk through this. Maybe company overview. If you don't know Cohesive, if you don't know a lot of these um, sponsors, check out their website. You know, if we were in New York right now, I'd ask you to visit their booth in the back of the room. We can't do that. Next best thing today, visit their website. Um, Cohesive's been around 20 years. You know, one of the things that, you know, sponsors, vendors, or, you know, whatever you want to call them, a lot of um, their makeup, uh, especially their consultancy, is former practitioners uh, through different industries, you know, whether it be power, whether it be utilities, whether it be public infrastructure, transit. Um, some of these companies have more in-depth uh, experience in those particular industries. So I, I encourage you to go visit the websites for each of these if you're not familiar with them. Uh, next slide, please. Cohesive, in addition to their um, Propel solution, they also have services. They have an assessment uh, called Momentum, where you can see trying, uh, tying in systems and processes. And we can go to the next slide for Propel. This is a solution in here. Um, you can see contact information for Matt Midas. Matt was really excited about um, the, uh, the on-site. Um, he saw the, the, the map of uh, Lower Manhattan. He saw a river on one side. Um, he saw the East River on the other side. And he figured he was going to bring his fishing equipment up for the uh, tributaries. So um, Matt, just pack that up. You can, you can bring that in the fall. Um, we can move to the next slide there, John. I'd like to uh, call out Scott Peluso and Interlock Solutions for uh, sponsoring us today as well. Um, their mobility, uh, Mobile Informer, is a, um, is, is a, is a very uh, strong presence in the Northeast. Um, a number of the Northeast Maxwell User Group members are utilizing Interlock's Mobile Informer. If, um, if again, if you, if you haven't been around long, if you haven't heard of Interlock, <laughs> they've been um, they're a very, very strong company, very good presence at all the, uh, the events, and an immediate sponsor of us. And I just want to say thank you to Scott um, in, the, in, the, in the Interlock team. Um, please visit them as well. I think we're going to go over to Microdesk. Microdesk is probably best known for their uh, BIM, Building Information Management Systems. I'd like to thank uh, George and Kristen for sponsoring us today. I look forward to seeing you uh, in, the, in the fall. Uh, I think we have another slide about a new solution that they're promoting, John. Um, the Asset Registry Information Database. As you can see, this, uh, the type might be a little small on this. So um, this, as I mentioned at the start of the call, this presentation and a recording is going to be made available to everyone here. So um, you can read this a little bit closer um, uh, when we send that out. Next slide, please. A little uh, workflow for, um, for Microdesk. If we can move on to uh, Prometheus Group. Uh, thank you very much to Prometheus Group for sponsoring us as, as well. Um, Jessica and Kayla, uh, thank you for your support. Uh, a lot of people are familiar with Prometheus um, from the acquisition of the Data Splice Mobility Tool as well as the Solidify Acquire Planning and Scheduling. Um, but as you can see, permitting and safety and a number of other um, uh, business practices on, the, on their overall platform. Um, you can see here in front of you on, the, on this um, graphic here. Uh, next slide, please. Why Prometheus? Best practices, integration, user-centric design, and group and agile development. Um, Prometheusgroup.com. 
I'd like to visit them after this. Uh, next slide, please. And finally, we'd like to thank um, Starboard Consulting, um, Karen and Amy. Uh, thank you very much. Um, Starboard um, and Karen and Amy go way back, even before, um, I think about 20 years ago, I was working with Karen and Amy while they were still at uh, EMA. I'm not sure they'd be happy I mentioned that, but um, thank you uh, for sponsoring us again. What are Starboard's differentiators? Um, expertise, proven approach, accelerators. All they do is Maximo. Maximo is their main business. Um, they have um, maybe everyone on this call has worked with someone at Starboard at some time. I know they have a huge presence within the Northeast Maximo user group, uh, user community. Uh, I just want to say thank you to uh, to them for uh, sponsoring us here today and uh, for the fall meeting in 2020. And. I was asked to include some information on JFC and Associates. We are a sponsor, we are a facilitating sponsor, so we, we did all the logistics for today. I'm working with um, George and Ilya, uh, Bob and Willie um, to make sure this went as smooth as we could. We did not want to um, stop the momentum for the Northeast Mass Music Group um, by canceling the on site. So this, that's why we had you know, the, the, the virtual, and uh, I'm glad we did. Um, just a little bit about JFC, um, an innovative thought leader in the AM space, um, public infrastructure, higher education, transit domain expertise and knowledge. We provide products and services around Maximo and um, a little shameless self-promotion. We were the Maximo 2019 award winner um, from the, at Maximo World for the best overall asset performance management program for our work at the state of California. If you'd like to learn a little bit more about Connects, please visit our, visit our website. Um, it's an IoT solution um, that's in play within the Northeast, um, and uh, it's not theory. It's actually in place for, um, for monitoring facilities and public infrastructure uh, facilities. If we can go to um, QA and feedback. And at this point, I'll cover this, but I'm going to turn it back over to Bob momentarily. Uh, but just to reiterate, uh, please submit your questions via the chat feature. Uh, if possible, if you can include your role in organization to give your questions some context. And if you have thoughts on um, the meeting theme of what does reliability mean to your organization, um, you know, please, um, please include that. And I'll give a second to uh, bring Bob back in. I think there's a couple of questions here um, we can start with. Uh, would you like me to to jump in then, Bill? And yeah, well, have a question too. You know, one of the things that you um, one of the slides that really caught my attention as we were developing this and you spoke about today is about your informed decisions. Um, and I just want to see if there is um, any. I know you talked about it a bit. If there's any other examples that you may you might use internally or during your discussions at Con Ed that might be beneficial for the audience today. Sure. Well, I, I love to look at our job from that perspective because it the fact that there are so and I've got slides in other presentations where you know you have your asset in the middle of the picture and then all around it you have all these different stakeholders, all these people who have an interest in that piece of equipment. And you know, there might be a regulator who 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 is wants to make sure you operate it safely and reliably so that your your service territory is goes uninterrupted. Or it might be, you know, the 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 uh, engineers who put this in place. Anyway, it's about um information, right? An exchange of information across all those stakeholders and one of the tricks is driving the collection of that information. And uh, that's why uh, we implemented Data Splice quite a while ago um, as more of the primary interface with all our maximum work orders, uh, at least in substations. What we're doing is having people, instead of just completing a work order, right? So you've got a work order that says maintain your batteries um, quarterly and do everything it says in the procedure. <clears throat> Excuse me, sorry about that. Um, and so if they just complete the work order, you could assume that they did everything you're supposed to do. Uh, we know that assuming things is not a good idea in most businesses. And so we want details. We want to understand exactly what people did in the field. And we also want to drive them to do the right thing. And that's why 
uh, instead of just completing work order, we have them answer a series of questions uh, in Data Splice in order to complete that work order. As a matter of fact, they cannot complete that work order directly in Maximo. They have to answer the questions to complete it. And by the way, a wonderful uh, benefit is they can't charge their labor against that job unless the status has changed from approved to in progress and then complete. So it forces, a strong word, but it forces people to give us the information we want, so back to information, about the work that took place in the field. And then that information might send an automated email to someone saying, hey, this was done, these batteries were replaced, and we, we asked the uh, people doing the work, what's the manufacturer, what's the model, what's the material type, all the things we need to know to make a decision about preventative maintenance in the future for those batteries. Or we found out what the uh, um, specifications were and whether or not something was in spec or out of spec. George and Ilya earlier when they were talking about uh, their line inspections uh, talked about the alarms that are there. If you say something that's out of spec, you enter a number that's out of spec, you inform that user immediately, hey, something's not right, put in a follow-up work order, and meanwhile, people get that information. So yeah, I'm kind of drifting a little bit here because it all ties together, but the bottom line is um, getting good information from people who have it and getting it to the people who need it and we use data splice in a big way to do that. Um, and I'll pause there because I could go on and on. <laughs> uh, Bob, we did have another question um, from uh, Richard Triffin about uh, as organizations are moving towards reliability centered maintenance um, by leading on inspections early in an asset's life, uh, concentrating them more densely in later life to extend the asset's life cycle, how can you better manage suppliers? always want to sell you the new asset. I saw that question and I and I thought about it. And that's a tricky one. I don't I maybe uh George, Nilia, or Willie have thoughts on that one. It's a good question, but it, it's it's deep and I give it some thought. But uh Yeah. I, I think it's a it's a very good question. And just off the top of my head, I think about, you know, the benefits of making a change with new and approved assets, if you will. And uh, what does, uh, you know, you look at the cost of implementation versus the, the life cycle cost or the maintenance cost of what you're currently using. Um, and the only thing I could think of if something like that came up would be the question is, is it worth it? That that's a good point, Willie, and that's what I was thinking. On that the beginning part of that question, we talk about um, you know reliability centered maintenance (RCM), but leaning out your inspections. Are we getting information that's worthwhile? You know that that's one mistake that um, sometimes is made, where people collect information for the sake of having information. But if it's not information that empowers a decision, what's the point, right? If it's not information we need somewhere then all you're doing is giving people unnecessary work to do. And by the way, your people in the field are going to quickly lose enthusiasm if you're asking them to give you something that isn't being used. So when you look at your the information you're getting from a job, you, ask, you have to ask yourself, do I really need all this? And if you don't, then that leaning out uh, portion of your question is what I think of by taking things out of um, out of an inspection, out of a scope of work, uh, that don't really need to be there. Yeah, that's a that's a great great point. I think a lot of organizations that focus on RCM strategies, um, really capturing those those data points to help inform design or redesign decisions. So you do see that a lot in the manufacturing space, whether it's you know how motors are configured in alignment with you know the piece of equipment that's operating, you know working with the suppliers on those efforts. I think you do see that in some um, delivery system configurations, um, especially. Um, so another question here for the group, and I think this kind of goes across all all three organizations. I'd like to hear from from each of you. I'm going to start with George. But um, uh, Lavinia uh, Gladys said she, she'd like to know, um, as presenters are dealing with critical assets that should be handled in a very restrictive way, uh, is the information uh, considered confidential and privileged, and how are you handling it? Yeah, I don't know. Um, 
George Perry yet. Yeah. I, I don't know that it's considered confidential or privileged, um, but we do try to track it to the best of our ability um, so that we can make those informed decisions. Um, how are we handling it? We're, uh, we're trying to centralize how we interpret this information and, um, and then how we act on it. Uh, instead of having it happen at the uh, each individual site, we're trying to run it through a centralized location uh, where those decisions can be made. And that is a good question because um, you know, security is always a consideration uh, and for your business type, maybe even a bigger consideration than another business type. And we've asked ourselves that question, is it okay to put a list of all of our security cameras in, in the system? And if we do, and should everybody be able to see where they are or, or something even more sensitive than that? Um, we're talking about, you know, the power for the city of New York and what, you know, and vulnerabilities. And we have to, we have to ask ourselves that question. I think the fact that you asked the question is very important, right? We have to ask ourselves about who can see what we're putting in the system. And the great thing is we can control that right through permissions, uh, security groups. So just because everybody can log into the system doesn't mean they can see everything. And I'm pretty sure that through things like automation scripts, and by the way, I'm not an IT person, I just am pretending to be one here, automation script or uh, cloning application, things like that, we can prevent people from seeing things that are more sensitive. So um, at this time, I don't think we've got anything in there that we are trying to, um, that we feel a need to hide from most users, but we certainly asked a question and we're actually currently considering it, um, how we will put more sensitive assets in there and then control their visibility. Yeah, we, we currently have, this is Willie, we, we currently have some assets that are considered sensitive, and those are not in Maximos. Uh, the most critical things like the access control doors and stuff like that, cameras, security cameras and stuff. Um, but we employ for other assets that are that could be considered critical, we, we employ the very same thing that well, was just mentioned where we have uh, data, data restrictions and security permissions within the application that allows users to go in, for example, our fleet group, when they go in, they can only see fleet vehicles or fleet assets. Uh, when our building maintenance group that's separate from facilities, when they go in, they cannot see or act on any uh, any of the facility uh, assets or, or inventory. So uh, we kind of use that as a means of, of protecting. And until we get to a point where uh, our leadership is comfortable with putting more secure uh, or more critical uh, type assets in the system. We just tend to rely on uh, the, the permissions and the security that's built into the functionality of Maximum. Those are, those are great responses. So we've got a couple more questions here. Um, CJR6126, not quite sure who that is, but um, they, they say they're new to planning. What is oh, yeah, I know him. Uh, so what are some of the best practices for transferring asset information from project to Maximo, the age-old question of handover. So uh, maybe we'll start with uh, with Willie and, and and move on from there. What what are you guys doing over at Massport when you get new new assets installed and you have to get that information over to Maximo? Yeah. So one of the things that that uh, that I've been trying to do is this, uh, and we're in the process. We actually are implementing a new process for for getting that information. So when we have, like, for example, capital projects. We get involved at the design phase. So by the time we start seeing, for example, 90% drawings, we have a good feel for the type of assets and that are going to be going into the system. So we start working and we leverage our commissioning activity to actually collect and tag assets for us. Uh, so we begin by creating what we call functional locations in Maximal for each of the assets that are planned to go in. Uh, as the actual asset is installed in that location, we can update the asset information accordingly in, and load it into Maximo and assign it to that functional location. So we do that. And the intent there is that throughout, and the data is supposed to come into us throughout the construction phase. So we don't wait until the very end of construction to get the information and then load it. What we'd like to have is by the time we get to the end of construction and we're ready for turnover, all the information has already been loaded into the system. 
And it's not just collecting the information for assets going in, it's also identifying assets that are coming out so that they can be decommissioned in the in the and their associated records decommissioned in the system as well. George, yeah, that's, that's a good point. Oh, sorry. Well, I'll go ahead. And then um so I think we're talking about onboarding, right? And it, and one of the biggest challenges for asset management people at Maximo business administrators is knowing what's going on out there, right? Sometimes you hear secondhand that there's a new piece of equipment in service and nobody told you about it because the paperwork is oftentimes the last thing people are thinking about. They're celebrating the success of a project being completed, but nobody told us at the, in the uh, work management system that it needs to be put in. So one thing we've tried to do is inject ourselves into the process that exists already. Um, if people are already following a process around the uh, implementation, the activation, the uh, acceptance of that equipment, um, if you can get your enterprise asset management system into that process somehow. So for us, we have a maximal change request form. You can use service request for this, I think. Um, and we, when somebody wants to create an acceptance letter for uh, a new piece of equipment going into services, and this is a requirement in our company for um, by procedure. And so when they create, we, we started making it so you had to go into the maximal change request form to generate an acceptance letter. So everybody knows they've got to generate an acceptance letter and they've already in, they're already in that habit, but now they have to do it using the maximal change request form. So it generates the draft for them, by the way, it makes their job easier. And it notifies the maximum business admin team of the change. It also drives them to give you the right information. Because that's another problem with onboarding. As people say, hey, there's a new there's a new battery bank out there. Well, okay, I need a whole bunch of other information so I can apply the proper PM basis to it, or and and so on. So with this maximum change request form that they have to fill out in order to generate an acceptance letter, they are driven with required fields to put in the right information, manufacturer, material, model, et cetera. Um, and then we can apply the right PM basis to it. So that's one way is to inject yourself into an existing process that people are already doing somehow. You know, maybe you can imagine in your company something similar. Um, another thing we did is uh, things that you know are going to be replaced, like a battery bank. We replace battery banks approximately every 15 years. And when that happens, we have a maximum generated work order for the replacement. And in order to complete that work order, you have to fill out uh, a data splice job plan. And by the way, I think in, with the new anywhere and work centers, you may be able to implement something similar where they answer a number of questions um, associated with the event. And so they have to answer these questions and the questions are the things that we need to know about that new piece of equipment. So those are a couple thoughts that come to mind for me. Yeah, those are those are great, Bob. Appreciate that insight, Willie, as well. Uh, George, I got a kind of a question here for you. Um, tying into your ISO fifty five thousand journey, um, your guest wanted to know uh, how exactly is the roadmap to move from calendar based maintenance to condition based, ultimately AI based maintenance. Um, you know, what does a roadmap like that look like? You know, for your for your organization, how, how do you how do you make that transition from you know interval based to uh, condition based maintenance? Well, I think uh, there's a lot of things to expect or into that. Uh, the first of which is just uh, trying to understand your assets and understand what understand what's really necessary. Um, after that, uh, realizing that you know there are times when you're uh, doing maintenance on equipment uh, that's not at all required, and there's really no reason why you're doing, it, doing it except for the fact the that call. Very that's how you've always done it. Please. Um, and then to become no, more don't. progressive and realize that no, Nick, some of this not, get out uh, of here. maintenance isn't necessary, Please. isn't required, and we can get along fine without it. When you move to condition-based maintenance, Nick. you're understanding um, based on the feedback you're getting from the equipment uh, for many different um, uh, uh, software and other reporting uh, that we use uh, that's telling us what the actual health of the equipment is. So. You start to move from 
just doing something on a time base every three months, every six months, every year to starting to listen to what the equipment is telling you and what the equipment is telling you it needs. And then changing your philosophy over understanding, uh, you know, what that maintenance really should be as opposed to what it is you're doing now. Yeah, that's, that's great, George. Any any of the, the community members here, anyone leveraging IoT type devices um, to capture critical asset information or tying building automation system data or SCADA data into Maximo to do condition-based maintenance? Well, I can speak to a little bit of what we're doing. Uh, we are we have a project, a pilot program for uh, battery monitoring. I keep talking about batteries. Batteries are important, and it's something that a lot of a lot of different organizations would have anyway. So maybe more more uh, members of the community can relate. But we're putting in remote monitoring for batteries and also for pump house um, readings on our dielectric system. So putting in uh, remote monitoring that sends back information that might otherwise have to be done by a human, a human who has to get in a car and drive through city traffic in Manhattan and risk uh, possibly an accident or worse and so on. If, if we can save that trip and save that labor and automate the information and, by the way, get it to us quicker, um, that's a great thing. So we have a couple different programs in place, one for battery monitoring and one for uh, tank level monitoring and communicating it remotely. Yeah, we don't have anything in place yet at Massport. We are looking at uh, tying into our BMS system and um, uh, identifying critical points that we can begin to monitor with Maximo, but we have not uh, we have not done anything with it as of yet. George and Ilya, you guys doing anything at NIPA for uh, remote sensor monitoring integrations back to Maximo? Uh, yes, we have a, uh, a pretty wide-ranging sensor deployment program underway, uh, and, and that's what I talked about, our integrated smart operations center. Uh, we're funneling all that information into that center where it can be evaluated, and then um, we can act on it in real time. That's all, that's all great. Um, so tying back to some of the, the things that we talked about, we got another question here from uh, from Leonard. Uh, what asset data is essential to improving reliability? That's a great question. Um, so let's start there, and then there's a little bit of a follow-up. But uh, so in terms of, and, and Bob, you talked a little bit about this, you know, what's the right data? Um, really the focus on, you know, the uh, what data is going to help you in your improving your reliability efforts. So... I'll tell a little story if that's okay. Um, it, this was in the news, everybody knows about it. If you saw the news, we had a failure in a substation in Brooklyn, catastrophic, knocked out um, several feeders at the same time, very unusual. And it stranded a bunch of people on subways for a few hours on a Sunday afternoon. Um, the governor was immediately calling for our heads, right? And, you know, we can all relate to some circumstance like that. Things happen sometimes. We don't want them to happen. So um, when we pull the thread on this thing um, and uh, and how often is it that we get better because we uh, something happened and we look closely at why it happened. Um, so we look closely at why it happened. And while things were in place already that should have prevented it, that doesn't mean we couldn't get better. And what we did was start looking more closely at the very detailed information about the assets, in this case, circuit breakers. Um, we uh, recognize that there is, uh, when it comes to the specifications to which a circuit breaker should be um, maintained, it varied uh, considerably from model to model. And even within what we thought was the same model, when we looked closer, there were different mechanisms in that model that required different setting. And so we got much more, um, what's the term, uh, oh, the, in our maintenance, it was more precision maintenance in the way we did things. And so on our asset records in Maxima, we used the classifications function to put specifications on the specifications tab on an asset record that were unique to um, a set of circuit breakers. And now we know exactly on every breaker what the mechanism is, 
what the cycles are and other specifications that tell us what the correct PM basis is. So in answer to the question, um, we need to collect very important key specific details about assets in order to understand the correct PM basis for that asset. Um, and I'm sure, you know, everybody can think of examples in your own world. So that's one thing that comes to mind for me. And when uh, and, uh, I'm not doing it yet at Massport, but one of the things that I have done in the past is that we started uh, we started looking at our PM program and always understand that a, a preventive maintenance program should be dynamic, right? It should be reviewed. It should be changing all the time. And, um, and so what we started doing, we, we started looking at the maintenance that was performed and start trying to correlate the preventive maintenance activity to corrective maintenance work orders, where we started being able to tell whether or not the preventive maintenance activity we were doing were actually inducing breakdowns or whether or not the preventive maintenance activities we were doing, whether or not there was ever a need for a corrective action to address that particular, that particular activity. So we started looking at that kind of a correlation and we would do what we call maintenance, uh, system maintenance needs assessments where we would look at all the preventive maintenance, all the corrective maintenance and start trying to draw a correlation between the two, whether one was, imp how one was impacting the other and then we would make changes accordingly. I think from uh, our perspective, um, asset information has to be complete, it has to be correct, it has to be accurate, it has to be historical, and it has to be in some kind of usable format. And all of those things enable it to be used to make decisions. And if you don't have any, have some of that in line, what happens is it causes you to make decisions that are erroneous and really uh, aren't of much value to the organization. So. Um, We've uh, implemented a data quality tool um, in our department that uh, helps us to understand if that information is complete, correct, and accurate, and in usable format. And kind of a follow-up for, for the group on that question in terms of what asset, asset data is essential to improve reliability. Um, you know, the utilizing of failure failure codes and failure hierarchies to, to improve it as well. Um, how, how effective uh, do you find those failure hierarchies in helping you uh, understand global issues or correlate problems that you're having with similar asset classes with your organizations? Well, I, I don't want to bogart the questions here, but I think something comes to mind for every one of them, I think. Um, for us, we, uh, for a long time, we used the uh, failure class and problem code uh, structure in Maximo. And by the way, a lot of the solutions we've implemented over the 20 years, we've had a need and we've seen, uh, we've been proactive and wanted to create a solution ahead of the time when it was really there in Maximo. And so in a way we were at a disadvantage for being on Maximo early. And so we had to come up with our own solutions to that uh, out of box, right? Something that isn't in, wasn't in Maximo at the time that is there now. So when I talk about the fact that we do something a certain way, um, you may very well be able to do it right in Maximo with your out-of-box Maximo uh, implementation. So back to the question. Um, sorry, I drifted. John, what was the question again? Uh, just just leveraging those failure hierarchies to to really identify right. you know consistencies or, or commonalities to improve reliability efforts. Right. So we participate in the North American Transmission Forum, which is all transmission providers across the country. And one thing we're developing um, with that forum is error coding and a problem coding standardized structure. And this kind of speaks to the question about vendors earlier, too. I forgot about that. Um, in that we, we are looking at, so we have a whole hierarchy in data splice for correct maintenance work orders. So if somebody goes to complete a corrective maintenance work order in data splice, they have to answer questions and through applicability. So let's say they say this was um, this was a problem on a transformer. And the subsequent questions pertain to transformers. What category? Was it mechanical, electrical, whatever? Um, was it uh, insulation? You choose that and then next 
you get into more of the problem code and the failure component as well. And they're standardized lists that we can, and so we can take that information and uh, we have a confidentially confidentiality agreement with NATF, so I don't want to go any further in the details about it, but the point is at Con Ed, we get, we're collecting standardized details about certain equipment that we can map back to models and manufacturers and then um, understand what failure modes we have over and over again and then see something we have to target to get better at it. But we're doing that through data splice, through the functionality from data splice of uh, pick lists, um, applicability in question, so that one job plan in data splice, which is the default job plan for corrective maintenance work, um, automatically applies to all corrective maintenance work orders when somebody clicks begin inspection to document the work, and then it takes a logical uh, chain down for that particular asset type um, to collect the right failure codes, problem codes, failure components, and then we'll get a database of information to understand what's going on out there and what's breaking, and then we can take it from there. I kind of want to just add add some content to this too, and maybe George and, and Willie can add some some feedback here. So one of the questions um, relative to analyzing that data, you know, how how are you how are you doing that in Maximo? Do you have reports that are written for specific functions, queries that you do, leveraging escalations? Are you doing notifications if there's so many failures of a certain type, and any kind of things like that to maybe analyze that data or get out ahead of problems? Uh, I have to admit at Massport, that's where we are way behind right now. Well, I'm going to say way behind because we're still in the process of uh, getting everybody on board, but uh, we have some failure codes. Uh, I'm not even sure of the veracity of them, how how valuable they are. Uh, so uh, we're in the process of upgrading and moving facilities into 7.6, and that'll be one of the things that we'll be taking a look at all those failure codes and how useful they are. Um, so that's kind of where we stand with the with the whole um, that whole thing. So at, at New York Power Authority, uh, we do use uh, failure codes, and we have a uh, problem cause remedy uh, philosophy around it. Uh, we employ pick lists so that we can um, properly understand, you know, what happened, uh, what caused it to happen, and then what was done to rectify it. Uh, we can use that information uh, to apply what we've learned against uh, like assets at various lo locations across the company. Um, so we build a historical uh, relationship between like assets, understand what you know what's happening with them, and then uh, that allows us to get out in front of uh, you know future failures. Yeah, and kind of a, another uh, kind of a follow up to all this, right? So understanding where you are, benchmarking your information, knowing knowing how effective you are. are. Are any of you utilizing different providers or service tools out there for comparing your your productivity or your um, capability in your systems with other like-minded service providers or any any insights you have there to share information? I know in higher ed we have uh, APA as, a, as an organization that allows for benchmarking and any insights you guys could provide there? I'm well, sorry, I, I, I mentioned. Yeah. No, no, no. No insight on this part. Uh, anyway. Well, I just it makes me think of other forums that are industry forums, and you know, we do we do participate a lot in situations like that. But it's um, not automated or anything. It's just uh, meetings, conversations, participating in committees, and and specific efforts. Yeah, and this is kind of to answer Amin's question. I mean, we see this a lot in the space that a lot of times the information is very difficult to compare yourself to someone else. Um, one of the things that you want to honor, we, we have working with folks focusing on is just, you know, establishing those benchmarks and those metrics for your organization and then to determine how effective your maintenance and reliability tactics are is, is not so much what the number is, it's just the direction, right? So you're improving over time. And those types of things. So, I, you know, Bob made the point. I mean, a lot of the industries that you're involved with will have um, forums or um, organizations that you can coordinate with um, specifically.
to what you're you're trying to accomplish there. So, uh, good good question. Yeah, we try to you know we 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 establish our metrics and we establish what our goals are, and then we report on those and we and we look at that to see how we can improve. But uh, but the comparison is really to ourselves uh, and and what our goals are as opposed to anyone else. All right, I'm going to end with this question. I'm going to go around the horn here. I'm going to start with George. Um, whose job is reliability in your organization? <laughs> well, that's the uh, thanks for the softball question there. That's the easiest one because the answer is it's everyone. Um, everybody in our organization has some effect on our reliability, and um, they, they all take it very seriously, whether it's operations, maintenance, Asset information, asset management, um, our uh, integrated smart operations center, um, operations as a whole, uh, everybody is involved with that, and uh, and everybody has an effect on it. Willie, what about you guys? Yeah, I agree. I, it's everybody. Uh, we try to uh, with our with our construction project managers. Uh, you know, we try to bring asset management and reliability into that. And one of my goals that I'm working towards is that when we're looking at uh, doing a, a, a renovation or when we're looking at building a new building, that uh, that the project managers, that the design engineers can take a look at at, um, at the maintenance history of certain types of assets or understand what assets are impacted and uh, and have that maintenance history and that maintenance information factor into uh, assets that are are selected for for the projects. So um, and then uh, in even down to facilities and technicians out in the field as they're collecting information. As has been said before, the information is accurate, uh, and and that the uh, comments or any information that comes from the technician is relevant to the job at hand. So it's it's everybody's role, uh, even uh, mine, when it comes to managing the system. Uh, making sure and ensuring that the information in the system is accurate and is complete and is timely. So I, I say it's, it's everybody's role. Yeah, and I'm going to switch the question up a little bit for Bob to make it harder for him. Um, so obviously <laughs> everyone's role in the organization is uh, for reliability. Um, everyone's everyone's job is reliability. How do you communicate what each of those different folks and groups and organizations' roles are in that reliability journey? Hmm. Yeah, I was thinking, I, I agreed, it, it is everyone's job, but I think it's our job, asset management professionals um, or whatever you call yourself in your organization, uh, it's our job to make sure they know what their role is, right? So uh, through targeted communication, as I mentioned before, emails that remind them, hey, you, you've got this thing to do or emails that let them know, hey, this problem happened and your response is is required or your documentation is needed here or and, and so on. So I think um, it, one of the great tools we have to use is our communication tools um, because everybody has to know what they need to do. and. The, our job is to be thinking about how they can support reliability. Um, and they may not realize they're even doing it, but we're getting them to do it by targeting them and, and you know, managing them and we're pushing them in the right direction through, and we use automated emails, we use uh, notifications that, that can come from Maximo and Data Splice and other tools and uh, you know, use all those tools to push people in the right direction to do the right thing and to make them aware of uh, timeline what they need to, when they need to do things. That's great. Uh, all, all really great questions and, and great feedback here. Um, so I just wanted to hand things back over to uh, Bill Thompson here to kind of bring us uh, to a conclusion here. And uh, Bill, if uh, you want to, to uh, wrap things up, that'd be great. Thanks, John. If you could, yeah, I'm kind of stealing this from Bob, um, but I don't think he'd mind. Um, first, uh, thank you for attending. Um, please consider submitting an abstract on what reliability means to your organization for the fall 2020 meeting 
although it may not be the theme, it is uh, the root of all uh, things that we do. Um, our next meeting is planned to be on site. Obviously, we're not going to give any details on that right now because we don't know what is going on in the world. Um, I did set a, um, a target of October 6, 2020, uh, six months from uh, today, basically. And, um, you know, talking about the, the value of uh, these types of forums and these types of user communities, um, just a quote that uh, I read probably about six months ago. It's, it's pretty well known. I think it's very applicable to um, you know what we're doing here. Um, it's attributed to um, an old African proverb: If you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And that's the that's the purpose of us here today. So um, we couldn't do it without the steering committee members. And most importantly, we couldn't do it without an audience. We had over 180 people here today. Um, we were able to pull it off, and uh, it's everyone who came together to do this. So, um, thank you to uh, Bob Fike, uh, our chairman. Thank you to Willie Hicks um, from Massport. Thank you to John Gould uh, from JFC. Thank you to George Nilia from New York Power Authority. And most of all, thank you to, to our sponsors and to all the attendees today that made this, um, you know, the, the, the engagement we had through the QA, um, you know, is why we have these live meetings. So, um, Special thanks to John Gould. Um, one, it's his birthday today, and two, he made this work because if I was driving this, we wouldn't get to this point where we're at right now. So, for the Northeast Maximum Use Group, uh, thank you, and uh, have a great day. Thank you, Bill. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, great. Bill. Be well.